good morning to you all again feel privileged to be part of such a program it has been the first opportunity to serve as external today for the phd student i would like to share um, i'm not going to tell something great actually but what's relevant in today's uh, bt cotton what's happening in cotton field what's happening with respect to the cotton breeding as such so i would like to shed light on these aspects sorry for that right right so we'll go through what kind of regulatory mechanism that exists when it comes to cotton cultivation right so you're all pg students right so you find regulation regulation or regulatory mechanism in store in the university also right how many forms you fill up by the time you end up uh, completing the degree be it msc or be it a phd right you go through eight to 10 different forms actually right wherein you specify as to what courses you are taking up right and what kind of research how many credits and all such things right so regulation if it exists is it for the good or uh, or it's for creating obstacles kind of a thing some feel it's obstacles actually right but if you look at a broader perspective it's rather needed for quality improvement right so it's rather very important in the sense it ensures that the improvement happens in the right perspective rather so in that reason uh, in the, for that reason regulatory mechanisms are very much need of any nation any nation for that matter actually so we'll go through what kind of regulatory mechanisms exist in the later part and there is also always a debate in this country whether bt cotton has been a huge success or it has been a case of a failure there are two schools of thought proposed by different proponents while one school feels and there it is to be seen on the field i could see villages i i do visit a lot of farmers uh, fields as well as villages and uh, usually in a, if you take any village right it has been like that in the society the weaker sections the marginalized communities they used to stay in thatched roofs rather till bt cotton came and uh, i was stunned with one of the answer from one of the farmer right he was telling uh, we were on the roof top of uh, the gowda of that village sir the village head of that village right so naturally he comes from a elite background elite family so on top of his fam uh, house uh, we were having lunch and then he just told all these lines which you see rcc building sir uh, these were used to be huts and since the bt cotton has come they have transformed themselves into concrete buildings concrete houses now how you see as a socio economic change being brought about right so it's very clear the technology is there we'll try through presentation we'll go through both the debatable issues when i say success what does that mean when i mean failure is it really a failure We'll try to see that actually now this slide actually talks about it's the era of uh, genetically engineered crops and you're all fortunate to be in the same era that means you have wonderful opportunities to serve in your capacities to either identify such products which are going to be of genetically engineered ones gone are the days right conventional breeding is not going to help anymore you have to transform yourself and genetic engineer products are going to be the say in the future and if you could see dozens of crops being public institutes 
even public institutes have started working on genetic engineering these days add the gene editing tool the recent concept people are working on these traits and mind you when you go actually let i put, let me put a one simple question when you would like to go for a transgenic uh, work actually is it that just you would like to go or uh, are there any criteria which uh, are needed to ensure that before you go into transgenic technology right so simple if the trait is not there in the germplasm that means the trait can't be improved right if the trait is not there in the entire gene pool you have to do something radical things something different approaches you have to follow and that's where this transgenic technology comes into fore you look at the crossability barriers it has overcome right could you imagine a gene from a sorghum being put into maize a gene from bajra being put into say paddy right so why you can't do because crossability barriers natural crossability barrier exists right so come transgenics you can transfer a gene from anything to everything right that's why it's called as transgenic technology you all know that right so this slide actually talks of uh, all the crops i think i will just uh, to be more yeah i think right okay so this slide actually talks of uh, the various crops globally where transgenics have arrived at if you look at india actually right you find only one crop over there that of the bt cotton we had a chance to approve brinjal we had a chance to approve chili few years back and what has happened you all know that actually right i hope you remember uh, i think my um, teach your teachers might be knowing that what happened in bangalore right uh, ramesh uh, i think he was the minister right now what he did uh, jairam ramesh right um, he openly says in the media that uh, you scientists are not in line with the technology you are professing so if you start debating discussing science in a heterogeneous environment heterogeneous masses the people who don't know our country is such no everyone has opinion without understanding hmm? they just stand stand to oppose now you as students of plant breeding and genetics and plant breeding especially you should know you should always be in a position to defend technology not to reduce the positives of the technology there has to be scientific background right right so we have seen that and that is the reason why india has only one transgenics to be exploited by the farmers commercially and efforts are on dozens of crops are being they are awaiting actually right the products are there to be seen in the coming years uh, so globally these many crops right from maize to apple people are working on transgenic sector uh, let me not go into this actually right so foreign gene right a gene from different background if you put it's called transgenic and why you would like to do actually i said earlier right the option is to bring about food as well as national uh, nutritional security and biotic and herbatic stresses are something we all are seeing these days right the pests and disease are coming with the bang right and look at the climate change right so you're not receiving rains i think tamil nadu has not received still rains i think right so is the case with our case also in karnataka and on the extreme what's happening in himachal pradesh you all know right landslides are happening cloud bursts are happening right so these are realities actually right so these are all the traits from herbicide resistance to the delayed ripening you see in tomato right so cotton happens to be two important traits work is going on one is very clear insect resistance people have worked and products are there to be seen the herbicide resistance is it uh, in its uh, i mean later st last stages rather 
people are evaluating i am also a part of um, evaluating herbicide resistance one of the company had approached us rallies company and we are doing brl trials i hope you all know what you mean by brl right so by safety regulatory level trials we are doing at raichur that comes to bt cotton actually you all know it comes from the soil bacterium and it was first developed by monsanto delta and pine companies back in 1987 and what kind of transgenics you have in bt cotton you have bolgard already exploited and then the new thing is that of roundup ready technology flex technology which puts up the herbicide resistance right now this is how it goes actually so what do you do actually you look for the candidate gene right once identified you put efforts for its gene transfer go for regeneration and then you make it to express in the desired level up to desired level once it is proven that the expression is of required level then it goes what called as the field tests are done and then finally it goes for approval it's being approved for the commercial cultivation right these are all uh, the cry genes with proteins listed on the left side of yours the slide so all these genes have been found the proteins have been found to be toxic to various insect orders you can see lepidoptera to diptera to coleoptera so cotton has been infested with more of the pests most of the pests they are of lepidopteran nature right so you can see on the right side there have been several subspecies of uh, the bacillus thuringiensis you can see their protein size being characterized the target insects they confer resistance to and then you find something called serotype in the last this one that means the group of organisms they are though they are different they have the ability to produce the same form of protein rather that's why they are grouped as serotypes you can see um, things over there okay now this slide i put because this is going to be future of cotton bt cotton now you might have seen in the media right um the pink bollworm has developed resistance and it's causing huge losses also i see farmers uh, complaining and realizing hardly one or two quintals per acre without realizing what loss is being incurred by whom because this is such a pest it is not to be seen by the farmer you can't see this uh, pest because it survives only on what it survives only in the seed it's not going to survive on any other plant part actually so it's going to be in the seed so that makes things that much different actually right so who all are working actually so bolgard one came claim it claimed that there will be pink bollworm resistance bolgard 2 also by monsanto they also claimed then that pink bollworm resistance it confers but it took almost 15 years to realize that it is not conferring resistance to pink bollworm right had it been the case pink bollworm shouldn't have arrived at but having said that right dow agro sciences has come out with uh, a new technology of staking genes where wide streak it's called as they are addressing this pink bollworm it's the next alternative which people are looking at dow agro sciences is the one which is gonna, you can see the stay uh, genes that are staked now buyer india is also working on twin link uh, technology wherein these many genes even jk seeds it's working on these combination staked genes and vip 3a is something they are working on the products are to be seen in coming years right so i put this slide because this is how the cotton moves now right so you can see all these events there are six events till 2009 the six events were there and they all the products they used to come from these six events there was something called ebam for commercial cultivation er earlier that is event based approval mechanism used to exist but for last 3 years it has been removed and any hybrid which goes through gac has now also go through aisrp testing right so aisrp testing 
which normal hybrids used to go for notification the same thing the notification the bt hybrids are also having to go through right earlier this was not existing so when uh, uh, what is the importance of notification actually what it does once notified what it does the hybrid comes into seed chain hmm? if there is no notification so companies never entered into seed chain they used to do at their will right they used to take seed production on the farmer's field no got being done no regulation they are not to be regulated now they are put under notification that means their seed chain is to be regulated now right so they have to undergo what normally hybrids and varieties they undergo there are three mechanisms that exists right can i use the board sir marker is there yeah i think it's there so there are three phases actually right so what it does actually first uh, okay um so first it has to be got released right so in release also two mechanisms exist you all know right one happens at the state level right state varietal release it's called so those who are working in aicrps a network program there you have cvrc right central varietal release committee there are two ways right so release so once released what is the next step the next step is that of notification right so who is the notification authority right there is a authority for that thank you the deputy director general ddg is actually heading that with 21 members or so big group it is all the joint secretaries seed right all those people will be on board even you all know right so it has to go through so release then followed by notification i should remember it doesn't takes end here actually the ultimate uh, uh, benefit of being a seed doesn't end with notification you should remember what follows is this registration is the one right now who is the registration authority this is the registration authority right so the end product of a variety or a genotype or a hybrid is not just notification you should remember it's rather registration of it once you register uh, what hell why you need to register man is there a need actually now you all have bikes i think no girls also have bike the bikes these days right so what do you do once you purchase the bikes you register it why don't register man if you don't register what happens you always to be taken up by someone and then he can claim also if he is very nice man wise man he can also claim that and it's not yours it's mine how you counter him then if you register you have a documentation actually right now this has to be understood by all right why you need registration your variety is a different entity right which you have bred you have a, a complete rights to be um, complete rights on that variety so how you protect your right through registration if it is really unique see people will come to you to seek those seeds right then you can dictate terms to them you can dictate only when you have the right and rights are conferred through registration right so it's very clear right right so these are two things which i wanted to talk about as to why the bt cotton was brought about the first ground was that it's going to bring down the usage of the pesticides Uh, by the way which is a crop which uh, warrants or demands highest number of insecticides it was cotton and it is cotton even after tra transgenic technology we will prove that later 
And then the other thing was that, okay, once you are in, right, the boll worm can be addressed. And thereby the crop losses can be reduced, thereby increasing the seed yields. And the logic that was used was, you just look at what quantum of insecticides were used. Almost 9,400 metric tons of insecticides was used. Look at the budgetary, this one. Almost 750 crores were used. Just to control bollworms again. Not for all the complexes actually. It's only for bollworm. And look at the diversity cotton invites for pests. No other crop would invite it. You have almost 162 species which survives on cotton. And among them, 15 are said to be key pests. Now time has come where we'll show later, right? The pest was not, never a pest on cotton, has become an important pest now. That's what happens in agriculture, right? A tertiary, a secondary pest becomes a primary pest, right? right. So let's, um, I was saying about this, right? This uh, talk is all about this actually. There is a debate long, it has been for long rather. And uh, if scientists don't defend the technology, now who else has to defend it? People say it's a technology failure, but I would say it's a technology management failure. Show me one report which actually shows that uh, the, the heliothis has been reported in any part of the country. There has been no single incidence of heliothis resistance, helicorpa resistance. Of course, the other bollworm has taken into account. This happens. This is science. This is not something which is a physical science. Uh, it's a biological science. And things will change because biological organisms, they are, right? So I would say it's a technology management failure. What has happened actually? Okay. Now you just see, you all have mobiles these days, right? The mobiles can uh, be used uh, in n number of ways. The very mobile you are using can be used for a very constructive usage, right? You can refer articles, go to any website, get information. The same thing can be used to the, the other side also. You start using unnecessarily irrelevant things if you keep on using, then it's not going to be advantageous to this one, right? So any technology for that matter will have positives as well as negatives. Now in this case, what has happened? You are giving technology to a farmer who is illiterate. Now, this is what I mean by technology management failure. We as a group of scientists have failed to transfer in total the technology to the farmer. There are complexities involved. Right, The complexities are in the sense, you look at uh, the cotton cultivation environment. The hybrid is bred for irrigated ecology. And uh, the rain-fed farmer also has access to the seed. No problem when rain-fed farmer gets good rains, he gets 20 quintals per hectare. I mean acre, in our side 20 to 25 acre quintals they are harnessing. Problem comes when the rainfall is not at the expected level. Now yields are directly related to, you take any crop, right? Yields are directly related to your rainfall, moisture content. Now you can't blame moisture deficit to be the reason for failure of the technology. You can't do that. Now this is somewhere we as a group of scientists have failed to convey to him. Now, coupled with that, we'll see it through later slides. What the technology was brought for something and uh, some other problems have cropped up. Naturally, it's science, it's, it's, net, it's agriculture. Agricultural ecology you're talking about, right? Right, this is one, uh, I will take two cases. Dr. Kranti, who actually served as director of CICR, he had his own views. So what he went through 
2006 to 2015, almost uh, a decade's time it is. Now, what he could analyze was even after adoption, with greater adoption, more than 90% adoption of Bt cotton is there, but there has been stagnation in terms of yields, it is what he says. There is no change in terms of drastic change. For last 10 years, the yield levels have remained so. Now he claims certain things. He just put uh, go through this actually. What the first claim for Bt cotton was that it's going to reduce the pesticide usage. Now has it really done? You just look at the blue worm talks about uh, the adoption of the technology, BT technology. It starts from zero from 2002 because this was the time when the BT technology was adopted, was made available to the farming, farming community. You can see the worm just goes up every year, right? And uh, right now it is 2014 data, but I would say still 96 or 98 percent is that of BT cotton these days. But what's alarming is that of the red worm. You just look at uh, the usage of insecticides in 2002. It was 0.9. And you just go through the worm as to how it has behaved and uh, come to nearing 2013-14. It's almost on the rise now, right? So the insecticide usage has not reduced actually. It has actually increased over years. And uh, to the recent data says that it's still on the high. It's more than one it has gone actually. Then the other thing actually, is there any truth in the yield claims of BT cotton proponents? That is a question actually. Now I would like to say this in two splits actually. If you look at the first part, the left part of the slide actually, right? Before BT cotton expansion, if you could see from one to five, there was 70% increase in terms of the yield. Basically because cultivation transformed from non-BT to BT. So 2001 was no BT cotton existed. So that's why from 278 to 45 you compare 470 that makes it a 70% increase. Now look at the other part actually. From 5, 6 to 11, 12, the next part, there has been only 2% increase, right? So this uh, actually graph talks about the countrywide adoption of the BT cotton. Almost uh, 18, it shows like that. It is more than that actually. Almost 96, 98%. The BT cotton has been there. Uh, it is there, there actually. So wide adaptation, statewide adaption, it has been all along the nation. This is the one actually. You look at uh, what you make out of this slide actually. If you look at the blue, the spraying for lepidopterans. You see it's all it's on the lower side. But look at the other part actually. Look at the spraying for sucking pests. This is where the usage of insecticides has increased. The usage of insecticide is not because of the control of lepidopteran. Lepidopteran has been controlled genetically. When you control it genetically you need pesticides. That's what you are here actually right. You want to use usage has to be brought down. It has to be through genetical means, right? So the funda is that there has been the other side. The sucking pests are on the higher side and it's almost uh, every eight days. Uh, if the farmer doesn't spray insecticide to control sucking pests, what is the impact is going to do on the on the plant health? Actually, if you suck the sap, is the plant going to be healthy? Naturally, right? All forms of uh, leaves being dewormed, right? Unhealthy leaves, leaf reddening is happening, right? All those matter comes up actually, right? Right, these are all the impacts of the BT cotton which we have seen. They used to say when uh, there's a possibility of super bug, super weed kind of a thing, right? And uh, somewhere we are realizing now, right? Some new major pests have come up. And uh, the cotton farmers crisis, it continues. And uh, why it is actually? The proponent said that the cost of cultivation will reduce. But it is happening the other way. 
why a farmer commits suicide when he moves from being sustainable agriculture to unsustainable agriculture indiscriminately if you start using any of the inputs he has started using uh, indiscriminate seed also nobody told farmer that you should not do that let me give i will share some some my this one, right so what has happened actually the hybrids were bred for this space right what is that so 90 cm between the rows and between the plants it was to be put at 60 cm right so what farmer did he never followed this some of the follow some of the farmers followed this system some farmers they followed this system and the next level farmer he went into this system. now what's happening there the hybrid uh, okay what's the main part of hybrid actually why it's called hybrid actually how you define hybrid or heterosis some other superiority of the son or parents or the checks when i say heterosis right heterosis is happening for all traits you should remember the plant height is increasing right the spread is increasing the number of bowls are increasing the bowl size is increasing right now we say this for this situation because that for which it has been bred 90 by 60 now what's going to happen to all these traits when you move to the situation first and then this situation happen to the plant actually see you are creating what's called as competition right they are all sitting in harmony here because the seeds are number of seeds are more than you you in number right suppose uh, 100 people enter this room now there will be chaos right chaos in the sense you start shouting kind of a thing right no plants can't shout can they shout they can't shout but what they can do they they are going to respond right once competition is there changes happen right so what the plant does is it starts dropping its flowers as simple as that when the flower itself drops then where come the possibility of bowls on the plant right now this is happening now this is where something we as scientists have failed to convince the farmer the companies have failed because for them business was as usual more than as usual actually right had the farmer grown this and put only one packet now instead of one the company is happy because three packets are going instead of one three packets are going he is happy he is not going to tell farmer oh restrict yourself to one packet man he is not going to tell that and the farmer's mentality is not like that also you should understand that also how many of you from farming community actually wonderful wonderful so what happens here we are dealing with new age farmers these days <laughs> i keep on saying right so maybe my dad's uh, i have time na sir right sir. i will not bore you people right no boredom right so what has happened new generation and the immediate previous generation and the second generation from me right i mean not later earlier let's start with my grandfather generation so what he used to do he never used to sleep till the sunrise by sunrise he used to be in the field right and uh, come my dad comes now into the picture right he starts doing agriculture my dad has uh, his own problems 
he want first thing he does is um, let my son not do agriculture man let it st- stop with me who is doing going to do all this so much of efforts and the climate is not with me there are so much pressures right so he puts his son to best college that clan is gone he is not going to go to field the other person is that other co- situation is that he is not affording to give proper education to big schools um, he will ask him okay you just join schools over here in c grade uh, c villages okay so he will be there but he will never go to field and uh, the situation now comes that uh, this dad becomes um, old hmm? this fellow has to go to field now because he has not gone to school so agriculture he has to do anyway right now we are dealing with the third person actually who doesn't know agriculture he doesn't know what hybrid is he doesn't know what variety is so what it does he just goes to market pick the seeds okay then three this one i have seen farmers I have seen farmers who put five packets per acre, right? Now, if you just imagine, if you put like that, you look at that as a student of plant breeding, a heterotic hybrid, you say, and if you put like this, no way you are going to realize high performance. It's going to be problematic actually. Just think of what best situation will be. What? disease if it comes what happens so within a 10 15 days the plants are going to be in contact with each other right now what happens here actually if you put like this it takes at least two months to have physical contact with this plant and this plant you are isolating them right naturally a disease pest if it comes it's not going to spread at that much alarming rate right so all these things are happening actually right so there has been alarming increase in the usage of the chemical uh, fertilizers and there has been loss of crop diversity see now government is promoting if you uh, if you cultivate any crop other than cotton they are going to support you there are schemes now because cotton is not edible if everybody starts cultivating cotton now who is going to provide food to us then right this is another thing so naturally when technology is so robust everybody wants to put that it is going to take a beating with respect to crop diversity no other crop are to be seen if you come to my place in raichur from if you go any amount of miles it will be only one crop and if you go to command areas uh, we have two command areas in karnataka one is upper krishna and then the upper tungabhadra you find lakhs of hectares only paddy now if the same crop is there what are bringing what you are bringing genetic or what's happening uniformity you are bringing in now genetic uniformity is related to vulnerability so disease and pests are bound to increase right right so monsanto you all know what it has done it has established monopoly right all these matter days indian organic cotton has taken a serious beating these days uh let me not uh, go into this actually so it says that there has been increase in cotton yields by more than 300% pesticide consumption has been reduced by 50% it says acreage has increased by 150% and production has increased by 400% it's a data of uh, the director of economics and statistics government of india right what it has done at the farmers field actually if you look at uh, one thing is for sure there has been excellent control of bollworms if you look at the farmers income right 7 almost 7 and 1/2 thousands in rainfed area was a total income earlier now it has changed to 16000 in rainfed areas after this technology if you move to irrigated ecology it's almost 25000 per acre the farmer is getting profit now this speaks of the merits of the technology actually right and there is no doubt cotton is the only crop where multiple economy start once the it cotton leaves the farmer 
see farmer only sells cotton right lakhs and lakhs of people are involved in various activities right be it your textile be it your oil industry right so it has the ability to boost the economy in various forms right uh, right it's a similar with this one okay let's go to the other one actually right the other thing actually the this came um, 20 he talks about the positives of the technology right if you look like right the bt effects in terms of percentages versus these if you look if you look at the yield the yields have increased certainly the insecticide quantity of use has been reduced the profit has increased and the farm households living standards certainly they have increased there is no doubt about that the uh, same thing if you compare 2 to 4 and then 6 to 8 conventional as well as bt cotton you can see for all these parameters right you see a significant change happening with bt cotton right so i said why this uh, stagnation is happening in cotton we are seeing that the next level of yield increment is not happening so they say the GE events with high PT trait expression that is being followed. They're not giving, they didn't give enough importance to the white fly while breeding, right? Now this is raising its ugly head. PBW has shown. Now this is the next enemy number one in BT cotton cultivation, white fly. And the second most important aspect is that of the narrow genetic base that's happening. What do you mean by narrow genetic base? So you boil down using parents, drastically less number of parents to start using as their parents in hybridization. So one parent, they say 80% of the hybrids, BT cotton hybrids, they have one parent in common. And if you just imagine if that parent happens to be female, still uh, worrying it is. So this is another reason, right? And uh, in spite of that, this is something which uh, we used to tell in conventional breeding. It has continued with even transgenics also. How is yield related to fiber quality? It's negatively related. You increase yield, the fiber quality comes down actually. Now with the transgenic technology, there has no, no, it has not been possible to break this barrier actually. So the negativity still continues actually. So has BTCon changed the breeding perspective? Yes, certainly. In the sense, except uh, say leave out pink bollworm, the other bollworms are under control. This trait is something which uh, is extraordinary. Anybody working on cotton? Uh, yes. If you look like uh, last five or six years, the bull weight which is a commercial trait. See, plant breeding is all about what? It's not about only improvement, you should remember. What you should look into is commercial trades, you should remember, because that's the one which is going to fetch premium price to the farmers. And bowl weight has been such an important trait. We have seen, uh, we used to see hybrids of five grams or five and a half grams. Now, last year I could see a hybrid which had 8.4 grams bowl weight. So almost like a, a small Gawa kind of a thing, right? Now what kind of relation exists uh, for yield and bowl number actually? Anybody? As you increase the number of bowls, the yield increases. Okay. Now bowl size and bowl number? Negative. If the moment you increase bowl size, the bowl number is going to be reduced. We are seeing that in practically on the field, very big bowl size, right? So it's con it continues to be the best, this one, and things are happening. Even GOT quantum increase, almost 36% above you will get hybrids. Fiber length, fiber strength, they are acceptable. And somewhere, this low micron is something 
we have uh, we are uh, farmers are reporting the micro is turning out to be on the higher side because of the environment they say but they are working on this also right so we all public sector people we are working on non bt cotton as well as hybrids which are actually moderate in yields there is no comparison for sure let me tell you frankly because ultimately what matters is yield right and uh, can you compare apple with banana right apples are apple banana is banana right so in that sense now a platform is being created what has happened with uh, bg2 and bg1 now it has come into public domain right so when i didn't have the bt gene i used to complain okay we don't have gene now that i can have access to this huh? you should remember one thing okay anything that is patentable in india patents are territorial rights you should remember right so the moment a patent is given to you it's for certain period of 15 years so both bg1 and bg2 have lost their trait value you should remember so anybody can lay hands on this gene you follow segregating generations you can derive parents from them and you can develop hybrid your own hybrids these days so you can do that so that has given us some strength and maybe i am working on hybrid development the, um, it's in advanced stage, later stages now we are somewhere nearing private sector in terms of the bowl size in terms of we can't say we can we are nearing them but maybe half may mark can you compare same uh, private uh, r&d and uh, public r&d can you compare right the research and development is all related to how much funds you pump into research the public sectors we all know with great difficulty they are giving us salary i don't know when it's going to stop again <laughs> we don't know but private sector it's not like that you know um, let me give a lesson information to you people my juniors who have joined in companies the companies have come out with a logic now they are not going to give you a structured salary to you they will give you one base salary okay they have related your performance with the incentives they are going to give so if you come out with a hybrid which uh, becomes a big hit you are going to become a crorepati within a year or two that should make you dream of being a crorepati right so this has happened my juniors who have joined companies i will not name name the company as well as uh, the person uh, it has been only 4 years right so he came out with a hybrid which uh, uh, went into lakhs of hectares so they have made a mechanism where certain percentage of the trade the seed is going to make they are going to provide him as an incentive and that incentive was somewhere around 10 crores is what i was told now just imagine right gone are days huh? a structured salary don't think of a structured salary these days if you sincerely work a sincerity has to be there right and then if you put yourself into that you can make miracles for yourself as well as your family that's for sure i think there is some take away for you people from this presentation rather right so once you finish do it with sincerity the world is actually waiting for your you people actually the opportunity is great chances exist actually i put this slide purposely right you know borlog is being um, discredited these days for something which he might not have dreamt in his wildest dreams you know what people are blaming diabetes and heart attacks to norman borlog these days you know why had he not developed high yielding varieties which were responding to fertilizers right had he not brought these we could have still continued consuming the land resources 
What is the positive aspect of land race? What happens to its nutrition? They are very high on nutrition actually. People are working on biofortification these days. But those, those were naturally biofortified ones. We moved to these high yielding varieties. Now people blame Burlock for that actually. Uh, it's something which is unacceptable. He says these words, you just see. The people who oppose GM technology, he says this actually, right? So it's better to die eating GM food instead of dying of hunger actually. Maybe you just think of his intuition then, right? Maybe if you, what efforts he had put. Now why Green Revolution happened by the way? I'm not boring you people, right? Why Green Revolution happened, man? It was only because what he realized. See, we all breeders, we work, right? And uh, suppose one example, you might be working, okay? So what do you do actually? Okay. So a 10 into 10 half daily, how much hybrids you are going to create for evaluation? 10 into 10 minus 1 by 2, right? So that means 45 hybrids. Okay. All the 45 hybrids are going to be wonderful. Best ones? No. Either one or maybe two will be best. So, what is the utility of these 43? They are going to be dumped. Right? So, what Borlong did was look at his intuition. He was working in a summit, right? There were thousands and thousands of crosses being made and evaluated. Naturally, 1% of this, you work out 100 crosses. So what the intuition of Burlog was that? Why not send the F2s of this to different regions of the world? Right? Uh, you know what kind of population F2 is? We call it as dynamic population actually, right? What do you mean dynamic population? Each plant in F2, how it is? Is it same? It's each plant is unique. Each plant is different, right? So what I did was he just shared the germplasm to across the globe. And that was the reason why you it paved way for green revolution. Now, oh, sir is there especially after patent regime, right? No breeder wants to share his material these days. Oh, no, no, it's my right, he says. Have we become narrow in that sense? You still be narrow and expect that the next green revolution is going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen actually, right? They also say the next revolution has to happen in textbooks, they say that actually. The next revolution, if it has to happen, has to come from polygenes, they say, right? Because all these seven, eight, or 10, 12 decades, breeders have been working on the genes that are easy to breed, right? They have harnessed uh, exploited additive genes, they have harvested uh, the dominance. The next level of revolution, if it has to happen, it has to come through the polygenes, they say, which are going to be a difficult task, or challenging it will be, because you all know, right? Polygenes come with their own disadvantages also because they are influenced rather by environment, right? Right. That brings us to I'll think another ten minutes or so. I'll finish off. So let's come to the what kind of regulatory framework is needed when you have transgenics at place, right? Right. So all the regulation it hovers around this particular document, right? So the rules and guidelines for uh, recombinant DNA technology research and biocontainment of 2017. This has been, uh, guidelines have been issued, which takes into account every aspect of research and development involving transgenics. Be it, you start with its contained use in the laboratory, to its facilitation or certification, to its large scale manufacturing, 
its import export even how it is to be stored during research all the guidelines are in place so anybody who works on recombinant dna technology need to go through the guidelines actually um, i can't go every each and every aspect of this let me touch upon very important aspects that's involved in regulation actually so it all goes with uh, this particular act the epa act of 1986 which was made into rules in 1989 epa act you should remember once act or authority is formed what follows is the rules right how it's to be implemented right so any thing related to research on genetically engineered organisms right these rules are to be followed right there are six competent authorities for which the rules have been laid out under these rules of 1989 right as i said six competent authorities there the first is that of the recombinant dna advisory committee or dac it's called as its role is advisory it can only advise you nothing else than that right and you have ibscs at the institutional level then the rcgm review committee on genetic manipulation you have geac the genetic engineering appraisal committee so all these three they have regulatory or approval mechanism to be followed their role is that of regulatory or up giving approvals kind of a thing right then you have at the state level you have state level biotechnology coordination committee and then district level where the actual research field research is happening so there these two have a role in monitoring those trials right so you have from advisory to giving approval to monitoring competent authorities are given these responsibilities and roles they are to follow this let's go through individually as to what they mean okay let's come to rdac so the basic tenets of this lies in reviewing the developments in biotechnology at national and international levels so right now uh, mind you some go back 20 years back our scientists were not prepared to take up any biotechnological work so the country had to depend on the efforts that were going internationally right so what do you do then if you are not expert you depend on others and try to go through what they are doing and try to modify and manipulate it and have your own right so what it does is national as well as international what kind of efforts are going the duty of rdac is to review such developments once it does that it also recommends suitable and appropriate safety regulations because you need to have if something is happening internationally right mind you uh, there is another thing actually most of these research are done uh, by high end mncs hmm? uh, multinational companies will be doing next level of research and uh, these people are so naive and uh, so i mean with their own this one they are not going to share you 100% technology they are going to give you some 80 85% if problem comes up well, we are there they will tell right so that also exists so rdac what it does is what safety regulations are to be followed if you are to conduct recombinant research right from time to time it is going to actually recommend what suitable things are to be done what are the sops that are to be followed right and it also looks into long term policy for research in such cases in the long run next 10 years what is to be done right so it is going to evolve long term policy also for research on recombinant dna technology this is rdac next come to the rcgm what it does actually so it is the one as i said it monitors the safety related aspects in respect of research done on these genetically engineered organisms and rcgm includes uh, a host of different institutes so you have department of biotechnology people you have people from icmr people from icr the csir and other experts in their individual capacity 
right if a person is expertise right naturally they also feel uh, find place in the rcgm actually right right so it also comes out with uh, manuals of guidelines specifying procedure for regulatory process it is the duty of rcgm to come out with the manuals of guidelines actually involving research on all these ultimately you should remember what it all the efforts of rcgm ensures that it result it doesn't cause any harm to either humans human health or the environment so whatever your technology you bring out it's not it should not have any negative impact on any living organism right that is to be ensured right so in that way is lays down procedures restricting or prohibiting production sale importation and use of these organisms actually right right so this is how they are placed actually okay if you are not doing research as usr is doing right i am very sure sir tna has its own ibsc and people are working on recombinant dna technology because it has been a um, very great institute in terms of r&d i know that over years uh, ours being a small university we started just and we also have institute constituted ibsc and people are have started working on that the problem is that you have to have all these followed nowadays anything <coughs> what uh, is expected is the approvals have gone online gone are days you put a me this one i mean write letter to them seek approval no it's not like that you just go to ibkp and uh, you can submit the application online there is nothing like offline these days so all have gone online so it talks about the role and functioning of the ibsc and what the regulatory framework should be there you should remember one thing all these institutions should follow and adhere to the they have to be complied with whatever they say the guidelines that are in place they are to be complied with it says coming to the inst ibscs who is going to have an ibsc it can be a private institute it can be a public sector institute anybody who can do research capable of doing research on genetic modification genetic engineering can have that so all the institutions handling hazardous microorganisms and genetic engineering they can have this getting constituted it serves as a nodal point for implementing the guidelines and for interactions within the institutes you should remember in interaction is something which is going to help you right uh, when only when you interact you come to know things which you don't know actually right so that is ensured here now who all uh, this ibsc comprises it has the head of the institute usually the vice chancellor of the university he is actually the head of the institute in some cases the directorate of research director of research is also heading this institute all the scientists who are engaged in recombinant dna work they are made part a medical doctor right he serves as a bio safety officer actually so he is also made a part invariably he is a member and then one nominee is put from dbt he is called external dbt nominee himself just to because he is the one he is coming from outside institute so he is going to be a fair umpire kind of thing a referee kind of thing so what kind of work is happening he is going to monitor right so a dbt nominee will be there now all the institution handling these they are to prepare in assistance of the ibsc an on site emergency plan right what do you mean by the on site emergency plan suppose you are working on a hazardous microorganism a gene coming from it has nature hazardous nature with that in case there is an accidental release right so the institute has to have an emergency plan right it has to immediately report to, to the scientist has to report to first ibsc then the ibsc has to immediately report it to rcgm that this has happened and what uh, plans you have to restrict that you have to tell that also right so it has to update from time to time according to the guidelines whether you are following guidelines it has to keep on say uh, telling that make available required copies to these people the district level committee biotechnology coordination committee as well as the geac right 
Now, mind you, the district level and then the state level committees are the ones which are from the Department of Agriculture, right? Uh, we all know how the Department of Agriculture is working these days. Mm. And they're not mm, they're not doing what they are meant for, actually. Mm. Uh, what was they meant for, actually? Their work was basically extension related. What the scientist says, university says, that information was to be told to farmers. Now the government has put them to on different world, right? They are uh, selling the chemicals, fertilizer, seeds. They don't go to fields these days, right? <laughs> so these people are to be kept in uh, this one loop. They can't say, no, we don't know. You have to tell them that in your district, these kind of bias safety level trials are happening. So you have to monitor. And these are the things, right? Right. So we at uh, IBSC, we have uh, the IBSC installed by the RCGM. So in our case, the director of research is chairman. And one uh, Dr. Ramesh Bhatt, who is professor of uh, biotechnology, he is serving as DBT nominee. And uh, myself, I'm working as a, I'm serving as member secretary. One outside expert is there. He's again from biotechnology. We have one biosafety officer, which is mandatory. You need to have, right? So he is uh, the medical uh, RIMS direct one um, institute director over there. Government doctor he is. So he is made biosafety officer. And we have a host of internal experts also who come from different fields. Uh, this person is from biotechnology. This is from microbiology. And uh, this person is from uh, entomology. So you can have people of different sorts. They can be part, made part of member in the committee. Right, coming to GAC, as prescribed the rules, what are these are the duties of the GAC? It is to apprise activities involving large scale use of these organisms for research and development, industrial production from the environmental angle. Then to appraise proposals related to release of GE organisms. Then in case, if people are not following the guidelines, it has the ability to take punitive action against under these rules, right? It can take punitive action, right? So any information directly to GAC, you can visit this of, uh, website, right? All the deliberations, what are happening, right? It has to report it online. You can just go to, the, go to this and submit the proceedings. Right, coming to the state level uh, bio coordination, uh, biotechnology coordination committee. As I said, this is a lower rung uh, institute, right? So its objective is to what? What's the role that I said? Monitoring is the role, actually, right? So it inspects, investigates, and takes punitive action in case of violations of through this uh, board. I think every state will have this state pollution control board. Then to review periodically the safety and control measures established to handle G organisms. It acts as a nodal agency at the state level to assess damage, if any, due to accidental release. In case there is some accidental release, right? So this has the role to play actually. And coming to district level committee, again to monitor safety regulations. Uh, it also is supposed to visit these installations, when the trial is being done, these people are to be invited for that, right? And they shall also prepare an off-site emergency plan, right? And then the district level committee shall regularly submit to the higher level. What is the next level from district? It is a state level committee. It has to report it to the state level committee. Then uh, let's not go through all these actually, right? Um, there are how to contain actually. There are two things actually. Physical containment, biological containment. Two exists actually. Physical means the building structures you have, right? Biological containment means you put the non-BT around and contain the gene. You don't allow the gene to move actually out, right? That is ensured. Rather, will not go to into the details of this. Okay. Now this uh, student should know this actually. There are four different risk groups. When you talk of recombinant DNA technology, based on pathogenicity, its mode of transmission, what kind of host range exists, 
availability of preventive treatments if disease occurs do you have control measures in place if you don't have what happens you have seen with covid covid is live example right what happened you heard about wuhan na? what is that it is the creator of the virus actually right right they say it is accidentally released actually but you also have come across that it actually came out from one um, um, flesh market they say actually right from there it spread they say actually you never come to know because chinese will not tell you anything first of all they will not enter you uh, allow you to enter into the country even if they uh, uh, allow you to entry enter they just try to clean up first and then allow you to enter that's something which is chinese are known for right right so these risk groups are categorized into four let's see as to what they are risk group 1 what it is a microorganism that is unlikely to cause human animal plant disease that means if you use a gene from this microorganism it's not going to affect you right so that forms the risk group 1 risk group 2 a microorganism that can cause that can cause disease in humans animals or plants but the laboratory expo exposures may or may not cause serious infection to individual and risk of spread of infection is limited you start working on them you get infected but there are measures to control it's not going to spread right in that case it is put as risk group 2 risk group 3 a microorganism that can cause serious illness or the disease but it does not ordinarily spread from one infected individual to the other in that case it's put as rg3 rg4 is something which can cause serious illness to the plant or disease it can be readily transmitted from one individual to the another directly or indirectly this is the most dangerous group actually so based on the what kind of pathogenicity they have what is the host range they have so these risk groups are arrived at now if you look like say people are working on genetic engineering of all be it plants be it animals right be it microorganisms so they have uh, the safety levels as well as the facility designs for all you look at the first one for microorganisms <coughs> you have bio safety levels ranging from 1 to 4 similarly first for first for uh, for first four be it animals plants or the insects arthropods all these they have 1 to 4 the biosafety levels range from bsl 1 to here animal biosafety that's why it's called absl plant biosafety it's called as pbsl pbsl 1 to pbs 4 insects in ibsl it's called as again 1 to 4 if you start working on aquatic organisms it's called aqbsl and it exists at three levels right 1 to 3 right uh, i have explained this let me not go into again details of this so this is how it works so risk group 1 for bio safety level 1 as you increase the risk group can you see the bio safety level goes on increasing right with increased risk group there will be increased biosafety levels that are to be maintained right so this is the protocol that deals with international handling of all the genetic engineering organisms it's called how you spell it many of you will spell i know cartagena it's not cartagena it's called as so cartagena protocol on biosafety so movement of living lmos rather right it deals with this actually let me not go into very details um, what is the basic tenets of cbd three things actually what are those first is the conservation uh, i think they have left out what is the first part actually they are not written here right first part is it talks of sovereign rights the genetic resource a country has is their sovereign right the second is that of its conservation and sustainable use 
and the third is that of third part is something else actually right it's called abs not uh, the anti breaking system what is that abs access and benefit sharing right if i give access to you for my genetic resources it has to be on terms you have to share benefits arising out of the profits you are going to realize using my genetic resource right so abs it talks about right this slide i put uh, because lot of things are happening with respect to gene editing these days right this is how the globe actually i mean world reacts to anything you have been witness to the g20 summit actually what was unique about uh, this g20 actually you see when international treaties happen international um meetings happen right they come out with uh, one document at the end right the document says uh, who all are um, what opinion all the countries have on one issue right so i was just um, going through an video yesterday right never in the history in the g20 all the drafted lines have been signed by all the countries only this g20 had each para signed by all the 21 country g20 has become g21 these now because of the african union addition so even those also they signed mind you it's internationally what happens no um, some people will come with you some people will tell I, i will come later and some will tell no no i will never come with you right some people will tell uh, they will tell here i will be with you the moment you step out of the room they will tell no no i am not going to come with you so it happens with small meetings it happens now what has happened at international level we have to appreciate and why it has happened like that only because of the leadership right somewhere the leadership also counts actually the one who takes right all along with them no problem comes up now this slide i put because this talks about the gene editing which is the futuristic technology in the coming days you see most of the countries with dark green they are positive in the sense the gene editing not to be considered under the gmo rules right uh, you all know na transgenics the moment i talk about transgenics it is comes under regulation harsh regulatory framework comes into place right once uh, you have developed technology at least 4 to 5 years it will take to reach the farmer right so now the indian government has taken a decision that the gene editing products are not to be on same platform as that of the transgenics they are like any other conventional bred varieties or hybrids right so that what to, what is what's going to happen that 5 years which is to be lost it's not going to be lost now you should know one thing hmm? uh, as students of plant breeding um any variety any hybrid will have its own shelf life right four five years after that it stands to lose its ability right so somewhere it's going to be work wonders now there are some countries right they are partially positive decision they have shown they have in dominance partial dominance you know you have complete dominance or over dominance anybody would like to work on partial dominance actually given a chance with a partial dominance will give you partial yield so yields only man i would like to work actually so what's interested it over dominance actually right even complete dominance will give you what kind of a hybrid a hybrid which is again on par with the best parent non non not going to be useful so what you matter is over dominance actually right so some they say they are split right they are unknown between departments and agencies now some countries uh, this part actually it says we have not taken a position right we call them as people who sit on the fence hmm? let me not fall that side this side right and there are some countries which are negative right they say 
gene editing is to be considered to be regulated by as a GMO. That means this will again go for five years for testing kind of a thing. They don't want actually. And uh, there are some countries which uh, don't want any novel product to be tested in their country. Uh, we don't want anything. We are happy with whatever we have, right? So these people are not going to move anyway. Any a small portion, I think it exists. Uh, can I find it actually? Oh, the, this part. This part is that actually, <laughs> right? Anyway, right. So ultimately, you should end with uh, the sustainable development goals. We have to end. Very great, actually. It's very easy to tell this actually, right? End poverty in all its forms and hunger so that you achieve food security, nutritional security and promote sustainable agriculture. Ensure healthy lives and promote well-being, it says. Now, there is a debate actually, right? The average age life has increased, they say. Right? Um, but I don't see that happening. We see a 25 year old, a 28 year old succumbing to heart attacks these days. And uh, it's a debatable question, actually, right? Anyway, right. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity, sir. I would like to thank uh, the university for having extended this opportunity to come and serve as external. Uh, um, for Viva, external expert as Viva, and uh, especially for Kumar sir for having nominated me to serve as it. Uh, it was wonderful opportunity, and this uh, university, all of you, right, uh, feel proud that uh, you have entered into such a premier institute. Right, you are here only because of your merit. No chance for a moderator to come over here, right? So keep that in mind. And your presence in this wonderful campus should make you a best person to serve the country. Um, don't think in a, a small packets kind of a thing. Always think big. Always think that I have the ability to bring change in the society. And I would uh, still. Uh, Tell you people, advise you people. Don't go behind uh, that uh, salary kind of a class, salary kind of uh, in um, jobs and all. Right? I don't think uh, in our university of last eight years there is no recruitment. I think here it's more than nine years there is no recruitment. So recruitment in the universities leave aside. Don't think of that. And uh, come out as an entrepreneur. There is huge chance actually. If you can't invest, join a company, be sincere in your efforts. I gave an example to you people. If you put efforts these days, it's not going to be unheard. You will be rewarded. But only thing is you have to put your sincere efforts. So I wish uh, all of you a very bright future. Come out with flying colors and uh, let all of us serve this wonderful nation called Bharat actually. Now let's no, uh, stop using the word India. Now. Uh, some kind of a pride comes out when you use that word Bharat. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, right? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to one and all who are present here. Just I am Kumar, Professor of Plant Breeding and Genetics, who worked in the Department of Cotton as a professor and did during 2016 to 18. During that particular point of time, we were having Dr. Santanam. You may not be knowing that probably Dr. Nilagundi may be knowing. And he is the person who had founded the iCRIP at Kwaimbutu. He is a founder project coordinator. We brought him here. That time he was around 90 years. He used to say that what we have to do in cotton, that at least you aim for at least five bales per
per hectare. That is more than sufficient. Whatever the technology you have, whatever the variety or hybrid that you are going to cultivate, aim that you have to have at least five bales per hectare. That would be more than sufficient to meet out the needs of domestic as well as international market. So with that, just I will start the formal vote of thanks, which I have been assigned by Dr. Kalimagal and Dr. Rajeshwari, my classmate. Okay. Uh, I sincerely thank the university authorities, especially the vice chancellor, who had selected Dr. J. Prakash Mohan Nidagundi as an examiner to come over here from U.S. Raichu to conduct the final viva of examination of one of my PhD students, Dr. Mrs. Ms. Tebhatata Panda. Now he is a doctorate who had completed a doctorate and she had been declared as a doctoral candidate. So I am thankful to the university authorities of TNAU and the Raichu for having permitted him to come over here for conducting the viva and for delivering a wonderful lecture, especially on the BT cotton, its progress, process, and what we can do with that in the future course of time. I am highly thankful to Dr. Ravikeshwan, the director of CPBG, Dr. Sindhil, the dean SPGS, and all other university authorities who had been online or offline, who had witnessed what had happened for the past three and a half hours at here. And I am thankful to all the authorities of uh, both the universities, student friends. So because of you that he had been here and because of you that the university is existing, make the life more successful, have more interaction, have a good time. All the best. Thank you.